Good morning, everyone. Good news. Next week, we'll be having a 9 a.m. service. Only. Um, only. So that's very good news for you. So, so next week, you might show up and your seat might be taken. So you will be tested in your character to forgive uh, next week. But... Um, we're excited in the summer to have more time to connect. And so a picnic lunch next week and then a barbecue in a few weeks. We're excited just to get to know each other again, become reacquainted maybe with some friends that you've missed that go to the 11 o'clock service. So um, my wife and I will be away for a couple weeks. Uh, we're going to New York to see my family. And so I'm excited the next couple weeks you'll be hearing from Pastor Rose and Pastor Jen. And, and we'll be in, in New York uh, filling up with carbohydrates. So we're looking forward to that. Um, but we're going to miss you uh, a little bit. And, um, but we're just appreciative to be able to, to get away. Well, this week, I want to continue our series from the book of Acts. And our series is called Empowered. And just a general rule for the entire series is... We really don't think any of the concepts we're talking about in this series are possible without God. It's why we're, call, we're calling it empowered, is because all of what we're teaching is, is by the Holy Spirit. It's by the presence of God. It's, it's through God's word. It's by reflecting on his teaching, his truth, that we, we come to the place where we can do the things we're talking about. This week is no different I'm going to talk about a concept that both the church knows well and, and obviously the whole world knows well on forgiveness. But how many for you, forgiveness can be hard at times? Okay. And how many liars do we have in the room? <laughs> yes. Forgiveness is hard. But we're empowered to forgive. We're empowered to forgive because to forgive is to be like Jesus. Today we're going to look at the life of Stephen who lives a life as the, he's actually the first martyr in the Bible, which means he was the first one to be killed for his faith. First one to preach the gospel and to be killed. And his life wasn't just marked by the fact that he was killed for his faith, it was actually marked by something that he did at the end of his life, one of the last moments of his life that really struck me. As I was reading through Acts chapter six and seven, Stephen is preaching through basically the gospel in the Old Testament in front of a large group of people. But it's the end of his life, the last few moments that really gripped me and captured my attention. Stephen's life is one marked by grace and forgiveness for those that rejected him. The true marks of a follower of Jesus. Forgiveness is hard, especially if the person has never apologized for what they did. The person might not even know what they did. Say 80% of the time when you would go to someone and ask for or look for forgiveness, the person wouldn't even know what they did. But is an apology necessary for us to forgive? Is it necessary to hear a person say, I'm sorry to forgive? Is reconciliation required for forgiveness to happen? Can we forgive someone without expecting anything in return? As we look at the life and death of Stephen, these are some of the questions we'll look at when it comes to forgiveness. Today, I don't plan on offering you a whole bunch of answers. In fact, I'll probably give you more questions that you'll have to ponder. I don't plan on knowing all there is to know about forgiveness. I also... I didn't plan on speaking on this subject more than once, but I really think there's going to be a series in this because there's just so many different facets of forgiveness that I think are important. 
But Stephen's story offers the most difficult challenge that we can face in our lives. To forgive others with the measure that we have been forgiven. To forgive others with the same grace and measure that God has shown to us. We'll begin in Acts chapter six, verse eight, as we look at the life of Stephen. This was a man that Luke tells us, a man full of grace and power. Performed great wonders and signs among the people. Let's begin with the fact that it is God's power that is flowing through Stephen. It is God's grace that is flowing through Stephen. It is, he, he sees signs and wonders only because he's been empowered to do so. So the first thing I want to look at is forgiveness is not natural. Forgiveness is not natural. It isn't easy. It isn't something that you are born with. In the same way that I talked about generosity was not simple, it was not easy, and it was not something you're born with, forgiveness is not something you're born with. Just walk into a daycare and watch kids playing together. One kid punches another kid in the face, and the other kid doesn't just stand up and say, I forgive you. It's learned, it's hard, it's difficult. Even when there is an apology released, it's still difficult. But the first thing we look at, as Luke tells us, is that Stephen is a man full of grace and power. He's teaching through the Old Testament and the Sanhedrin, my favorite people. I've been slagging on them for weeks, the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, the Pharisees. They're looking at Stephen, they're watching Stephen, as the, and they're looking at him, and they see that his face was not merely human. They looked at Stephen, and as he's preaching, his face was glowing. Kind of like my face is glowing, but mine is glowing because of the light over me. And they're looking at him, and they disagree completely with what he's saying, and they, they actually hate him. But they take notice, this man is, there's something on him. There's somewhere that Stephen has been. There's someone that's had an effect on him. Now, of course, we would know what that is, but they're looking, wondering, what is this? Because normally the teachers of the day and the, the other Pharisees that teach or the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees that would speak, they didn't have the same look, so they were struck that there's something about Stephen that's different. Well, he's empowered. His face shone like an angel. Stephen is glowing because he has spent time in the, the presence of God. You see, the glory of God is the presence of God. It's the manifest presence of God. While God can be omnipresent everywhere at the same time, God shows up in particular times and moments and ways that is more obvious, it's more revealed, it's the manifest presence of God. And as God shows up in these places of space and time and situations, he leaves a mark on people, as will we sang in the song, and we know about the life of Moses, that when Moses encountered God, it left a mark on Moses' face. Moses shone because of the glory of God. And Stephen as well, Stephen has spent time in the presence of God, and because of the time he has spent in the presence of God, his face actually shone because he beheld the glory of God. Craig Keener, a theologian, says that under the new covenant, which we are in, under the new covenant, we can behold God's glory more plainly because of the Spirit. 
We can actually spend time in God's presence and not be obliterated because of our sin, because of the Holy Spirit that's within us. So the Holy Spirit that is within us gives us access into the presence of God in a way that for thousands of years that followers of God in the Old Testament could not even enter into his presence. Do you know that you sit in a privileged position today? Being able to behold the Lord's glory. Being able to spend time in his presence without exploding. I'm thankful for that. I don't like exploding into a million pieces. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. He says, and we all, how many of you are in all? Tough crowd. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory. And we, just hear me for a second, and we with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. This is a, an echo of the Old Testament. That as Paul is writing to the church in Corinth in this passage, they would be remembering one who saw God but was veiled. One who spoke to God but was veiled. One who met God on Mount Sinai, but was veiled. And Paul is saying, we with unveiled faces behold the Lord's glory, not only behold the Lord's glory, but are being transformed into the image that we are beholding. Now we do not become God, but we become like Jesus. In other words, as we come to God, we don't come veiled, we don't come hidden, we don't come ashamed, we actually come unashamed, naked, unafraid, open. And as we behold the glory of God, and as we stare into his beauty, and as we look into his eyes, we are actually being transformed. In other words, to spend time with Jesus is to become like Jesus. To behold the glory isn't simply to shine. It's to become like the one we behold. And we come to him unafraid. As in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve would walk with God in the cool of the day. Moses was hidden, veiled. We are unveiled. You will become like what you fix your eyes upon. Or as George Lucas says, your focus determines your reality. Our focus determines the reality we will live in. The only possible way for me to forgive like Jesus is to behold him, to stare at him, to study his life, his teaching, and to allow the impression of his presence and his goodness and his glory to radiate upon my soul because I don't want to forgive anyone. In my humanness, I want to hold offense against them. But, but the more I stare at Jesus, this crazy thing happens is, is my heart begins to be transformed to become like his heart. And in that moment, I... I run out of excuses, I run out of reasons why, and I, 
and I see his heart and I know his heart for the, the person that might have wronged me or hurt me and I, and I want to now forgive. I have to forgive, I have to. Contemplation leads to transformation. As I gaze upon the beauty of who Jesus is, I become more like him. As we look at Stephen, he is speaking to the Sanhedrin, and this is something you probably shouldn't say to people that have the ability to stone you, but he does it anyway. Stephen says to them in verse 51 of chapter 7, He's looking at them and he knows their resistance. He says, you stiff-necked people. I'm sure that was like an F-bomb in those days. <laughs> Your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? Now he's making fun of their whole family. They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him, Jesus. And you have received the law that was given through angels but have not obeyed it. Stephen is preaching through the Old Testament story leading to the crucifixion of Jesus. He preaches through all of it. And then he says to the religious, you stiff-necked people. This phrase, you stiff-necked people, occurs earlier in the Bible. In Exodus chapter 33, verse 3, Moses comes down from the mountain, Mount Sinai, and he has the Ten Commandments. The people are worshiping a golden calf. And Moses, again, his face shining, but he has this cover over, is coming down the mountain and he sees the people worshiping a golden calf. And God calls the people a stiff-necked people. God literally says to him, go toward the promised land, Moses. Take the people toward the promised land. But then God says, but I'm not even gonna go with you because the people are so stiff-necked. And then God says this to, the, to Moses, to the people. He said, if I go with you, I might kill you along the way. <laughs> Have you ever gotten to this point as a parent? <laughs> I know you won't admit it, but don't worry. God the Father got there too. He's looking at his children and he's like, you know what, if I go with you, you're gonna annoy me so much on the way, I'm probably gonna end up killing all of you. But stiff-necked means difficult to lead, obstinate, hard. You see, the people's hearts were hard, their ears were closed, and they resisted the Holy Spirit. Stephen says, your, your heart is hard, your ears are closed, and you resist the Holy Spirit. Now remember what the message is about. I'm talking about forgiveness today. Hard heart, closed ears, resisting the Holy Spirit. Perfect recipe for unforgiveness to settle on in there. Hard heart, closed ears, resisting the Holy Spirit. We continue on. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, verse 54, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. Can only imagine what that would sound like. Gnashing of teeth is, is not a, a pain. We often think of weeping and gnashing of teeth and we think pain, we think of some vision of the underworld of hell, but it's, gnashing of teeth is actually a saying of anger. Anger, they're angry, they're gnashing their teeth at him. Maybe you've done that as a parent. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. 
Can you imagine? He's preaching through. He calls them stiff-necked. He tells, tells them they're hard-hearted. Their ears are closed. They're resisting the Holy Spirit. They're gnashing their teeth at him, and he's like, hey, look. Look, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul, who would become Paul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he said this, he fell asleep. And we who with unveiled faces are being transformed into his likeness. Stephen is standing before the, the angry mob and he's not looking at them. He's looking up. He's looking at Jesus and he sees heaven opened up and he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And as he beholds Jesus, he says, forgive them, Lord. As he's looking at Jesus, he says, Lord, I give you my spirit. Of course, if you know the Bible and you've read through the crucifixion of Jesus, you will, you will hear the echo of Jesus who he himself on the cross said both of these things. He said first, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then Jesus said, into your hands, Father, I commit my spirit. Stephen, who is gazing up at Jesus in heaven and Jesus is standing before the Father, Stephen repeats the same thing that he heard Jesus say on the cross. In other words, Stephen has become like Jesus. There's something about looking at Jesus and becoming more like him that gives us the ability to forgive. In the famous Lord's Prayer, we read this. Jesus says, this is how you should pray. This is the model prayer. And Jesus says, our Father in heaven, how will it be your name? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. Yeah, I didn't want to agree with it either. But it's in the Bible. Could Jesus actually mean that I won't be forgiven? unless I forgive? Could Jesus actually mean that I will be forgiven in the same measure that I forgive? Could Jesus actually mean that the grace I receive is directly proportionate to the level of grace I give? Yeah. 
That's what it says. This is sobering. Forgiveness is a key to being forgiven. You might say that's pretty extreme, Joel. Think about this. Did Jesus sin? No. Jesus never sinned against anybody. Yet Jesus, at the end of his life, came to this moment where he forgave. He forgave those that sinned against him, that put the nails in his wrists. In other words, unforgiveness is sin. Jesus knew that he's on the cross. The last thing he does before he dies is forgives. I'd like to suggest that unforgiveness is actually sin. And Jesus knew that that was necessary to remain pure. And Stephen repeats this. There's varying levels of forgiveness. I don't have time to get into them all today, but I just want to mention a few to you. One is called detached forgiveness. Detached forgiveness is where we reduce the negative feelings towards someone, but there's no reconciliation that ever takes place. It's simply, I feel less hurt by this, usually due to distance and time. It's a detached. There was no conversation between us, just time, distance. I'm, I feel a little less worse than I did when it happened. There's also limited forgiveness, which is a reduction in negative feelings toward the offender, but relationship is partially restored. So here a conversation happened. We talked about it. Reconciliation won't happen. We can't go that far, but there's a partial, like we can be around each other at family dinners. There's obviously total forgiveness. And then there's total forgiveness and complete reconciliation. I'll give you an example of that. Total forgiveness and reconciliation in a marriage. Say that a husband and wife are arguing about a particular thing and, and after about 30 years, they decide to you know, really forgive. The hope is that the forgiveness would be total and reconciliation means the relationship would be completely restored to what it was 30 years ago in that particular area. Obviously, this is the best case scenario, but there's so many reasons why reconciliation doesn't happen and reconciliation sometimes can't happen. R.T. Kendall wrote in his book, Total Forgiveness, which was a gift to me. Thank you for that book. If you want a gut-wrenching book that will challenge you by total forgiveness, R.T. Kendall. He says, total forgiveness is releasing the bitterness in our hearts concerning what they have done. You see, when I withhold forgiveness, bitterness can set in. Resentment can set in. Justification, a desire for punishment, these things can set in when I withhold forgiveness. I don't give it. I know that I'm bitter or resentful when punishment happens and I still don't think it's enough. Now, 
Forgiveness does not mean a few things which I wanna share. Forgiveness doesn't mean approve what they did. Forgiveness doesn't mean excuse what they did. Forgiveness doesn't mean justify what they did or even pardon what they did. Forgiveness doesn't mean we forget what they did. Forgiveness doesn't mean we're pretending we're not hurt. I'm fine. I'm over it. Really? Forgiveness also doesn't mean reconciliation. What does forgiveness mean, you might ask? Being aware of what someone has done and still forgiving them. Choosing to keep no record of wrongs. Refusing to punish. Being merciful and gracious. The absence of bitterness. Bitterness is gone when there's no desire to get even with or punish the offender. Forgiveness means internal condition. You know that you've forgiven them. Forgiveness could mean forgiving ourselves. There's a famous story of Corey Ten Boom who she had protecting and hidden Jews during the war and the Nazis found out that she had been doing this and they arrested her and they sent Corey Ten Boom to a concentration camp. After the war was over, Corey Ten Boom survived, had suffered greatly in a concentration camp during the Holocaust, and she was preaching at a church on Sunday morning in Munich. She describes it this way, I was at church service in Munich when I saw him, a former SS man who stood guard at the shower door in the processing center at Ravensbrück. He was the first of our actual jailers that I had seen since that time, and suddenly it was all there, the room full of mocking men, the heaps of clothing, Betsy's pain-blanched face. He came up to me after the church was emptying. He was beaming. He said, how grateful I am for your message. Fraulein, he said to think that as you say, he has washed my sins away. His hand was thrust out to shake mine, and I, who preached so often to the people, the need to forgive, kept my hand at my side. Even as the angry, vengeful thoughts boiled within me, I saw the sin of them. Jesus Christ had died for this man. Was I going to ask for more? Lord Jesus, I prayed, forgive me and help me to forgive him. I tried to smile. I struggled to raise my hand. I I could not. I felt nothing, not the slightest spark of warmth or charity. And so again, I breathed a silent prayer. Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. As I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened. From my shoulder along my arm and through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him. While into my heart sprang a love for this stranger that almost overwhelmed me, And soon I discovered that it is not our forgiveness any more than our goodness that the world's healing tinges. But on this, when he tells us to love our enemies, 
He gives, along with the command, the love itself. We are given the opportunity to participate in the love that Jesus extends to the world with our forgiveness. I find this a great encouragement that Christ gives us the love we need to forgive as we practice forgiveness. I remember years ago I was um, working in construction management and I had a particular boss that was very difficult to deal with. My wife will still remember his full name because I said it every day. I remember one time we were sitting in a meeting and he, he, he was always a hard person just to get along with. He always looked for an opportunity to be the biggest person in the room and make everybody else feel like garbage. Maybe you know the type. I remember sitting in a meeting and, and I was sitting with bankers and the high level construction management team in this room and I had, I had simply written a note on a piece of paper that had to be circulated for other people to look at. And it was my own writing and I don't have the best writing. I always like to say I have the handwriting of a doctor, just not the salary. <laughs> I circulated this piece of paper. I had written a few things down, and it, and it got to him, and he said, he said, what three-year-old wrote this? And he held up the piece of paper. I said, oh, that's, that's my handwriting, thank you. He's like, why don't you write in all capitals? Like, this is construction. I can't even read this. And something happened in that moment to me. I started to write in all capitals. Every time I would write anything, I'd be writing in all capitals. And in that moment, something actually happened to me. I mean, I used to write cards in all capitals. You see, in that moment, I started to harbor unforgiveness. In that moment that blah, blah, blah hurt my feelings, I decided to hold resentment against him. And it actually changed the way I lived my life. Actually, literally, when I would sit down to write, I would remember, I'd remember that moment. I'd remember that pain. And I would say, remember to write in all capitals. And so I would, I changed the way I wrote. because of what he had said. You see, I was stuck in that construction trailer, mocked. I was stuck there. I, I had never moved on from that point. And this is what happens to us. The, this is what happens to us is people hurt us. Come on, I'm, I'm sharing real stuff with you today. People hurt us. And what happens in this is that we get stuck. We get stuck in these moments. And you know what happens when we don't forgive is the string begins to control. The moments control us, and we simply become puppets to past wounds, past trauma. And then Jesus comes along, and he says, listen, you've got to take the scissors of forgiveness, because you're held back. And so we come to Jesus, we spend time with Jesus, and we begin to get his heart for the people that have hurt us. And, and so instead of being controlled by these things like a puppet, he says, cut the string. Cut the strings. 
Just cut the strings. Let it go. Let it go. What they, mean, what they did is still not right. It's wrong in every possible way. But don't be controlled by the past. We have to cut the strings that control us. Some of us are stuck 40 years ago. Trauma from childhood. Abuse. A father that left. Words spoken to us. Lies spoken to us. Teachers who didn't believe in us. Whatever it is. And and there are these moments that I, I, I find as we're going through inner healing with lots of people. Inner healing It's never a wound from like yesterday. It's always from the distant past. And in inner healing, we talk about things with people they might have dealt with 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And they bring it up like it was yesterday. I ask the same question every time in inner healing. I just say, what what brings you in today? Or what are you living with that you don't want to live with anymore? And immediately, it's like this. It comes up. Tied to the past. Even yesterday, I was having a conversation. We were celebrating the life of of Florence saying it was a wonderful service. And after the service, I was talking to someone who's in their 80s. And she said something quite remarkable. I was talking to her about inner healing. and, And she said, it's... It's my past. It's my past. I just can't get over my past. Eighty years. Many times we think forgiveness means what they did was okay, and we're saying that, but it's not. It's just saying, Jesus, I, I, I forgive out of choice. I forgive because I don't want to be controlled anymore. I forgive because Christ forgave me. Stephen, full of grace and power, looks up into heaven, sees Jesus standing. Elsewhere in the Bible, it talks about Jesus sitting often, but in this picture, we have Jesus standing. My dad told me that's why he gave me the middle name Stephen, is because my dad thought that it was this moment that Jesus actually stood as a witness to Stephen's life. It caused Jesus himself to stand to say, I'm a witness for your life, Stephen. To stand in solidarity with Stephen as Stephen's life was taken from him. And Saul approved of this killing. The beautiful thing about the story is that like the soldier that was in the concentration camp with Corey Ten Boom, like that soldier would be forgiven. Saul himself, the one who they would lay their coats down, who approved Stephen's martyr, would actually become the greatest writer, evangelist, missionary, pastor that the church would ever see outside of Jesus. Saul would be transformed by his own encounter with seeing Jesus and never be the same. I'd like to invite the, actually I would like to pray first, sorry. I'd like to pray first. And the worship team to prepare. Father, this is not easy. We can't do it without your 
grace and your presence and your power, Lord, we are in need of your Holy Spirit to guide us, Lord, to soften our hearts, Lord, and I pray, Lord, that you would help us to first just ask the question, is there anybody in my life a situation that I'm stuck in, a relationship that maybe is from the distant past that I need to forgive? I pray, Lord, that you would soften our hearts Open our ears. We don't forgive because what they did was okay. We forgive because we don't want to be controlled by it anymore. We forgive because you forgave us. And Lord, whether we have the ability to even consider, even move toward forgiveness. I pray that in the days and weeks and months to come, you'd soften us enough to be able to release forgiveness to those that have hurt us, Lord. Thank you that you empower us to forgive. Rest upon us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Thank you, worship team.